Hello, my name is Rob Cameron, and I'm here with Adam Mills to talk from Roblox Corporation to talk about our solution of building load balancing using open source software. Uh, we love this story around how we were able to use not only open source technology, but open source infrastructure, or open source ideas. And we want to take you through the journey of how we've migrated over to this solution and the values and benefits it's had for us in our infrastructure. Uh, let me hand it over here to Adam so that way he can introduce himself. Hey, my name is Adam Mills. Uh, I'm currently a principal traffic engineer at Roblox. I've been doing bare metal infrastructure for about eight years for video games and online gaming. Um, uh, I've built uh, a number of different data centers uh, in a couple of different countries and a couple of different continents. Uh, I'm super passionate personally about um, gameplay for everyone at low latency. If uh, you Google search me, you'll probably find some talks that I may have done in the past at, uh, at Ansible Fest. I'm a huge Ansible advocate. Uh, and of course, the reason why I love working in Roblox is that my son is very passionate about uh, Roblox and playing on the platform. Rob. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. And as I mentioned, my name is Rob Cameron. I'm a technical director of infrastructure here. Uh, not uh, the, but of uh, infrastructure over here at Roblox. I love Linux. It's been one of my passions for my whole life. Um, very early on in my career, I was learning this Windows NT stuff and like really dedicated to it and excited. Uh, I bought a Linux magazine, installed it, and uh, will frankly never look back. I love containers, orchestration, using these types of systems, uh, Golang, and in my spare, spare time, I get to play cello. I, I love learning and doing that. Really hate outages and the silliness that goes with that and just dealing with like complex, you know, underwhelming APIs. Been doing this for about 20 years, and then that time I've offered, authored some books, worked on some patents, and just loved and doing a lot of uh, writing a lot of code here. Uh, so thank you for joining and uh, taking a hit listen to our story here today. So let's start talking a little about, about what is a Roblox and what does that mean? Uh, when I initially came here, some of my friends were joking for me that is it a Rob? Is it like Lox? You like Lox? You eat it? What is it? Great question. And if you don't have kids or you don't have nieces or nephews that may be interested in this, you may have no idea what the heck a Roblox is. So let's talk a little bit about what it is and what it provides and what we do. So what is Roblox? Roblox is a massively multiplayer and online game creation platform. That's a lot of words, but ideally what you can do is you can not only go online, chat with your friends, play specific games with them, but you can also create and build your own games yourself. Players from all over the world, whether it's from China to the United States to Europe to Middle East, all are able to play together on one global platform. And the idea is, is we don't want to divide friends from being able to play from each other. So if you're in England and you have a friend in, in Arizona and in, in United States, you can play together and just, it doesn't matter where you're at. We figure all that out for you. As I mentioned, anyone from a young child to yourself, please don't run and start creating a game right now. We want to get through this presentation. You can create your own game, publish it, and even monetize it on our platform. And the idea is, is by using our platform, you use all of our game creation tools, all of the capabilities that we have, and you can just go and publish that game right away. We have over 100 million monthly active users that engage and play on our platform. And what's amazing about our games is it's not 200 games of just, you know, killing and shooting each other. We have games where people work literally at a pizza place. Somebody might box the pizza, somebody might create the pizza, other people might deliver it. Maybe you just go back to your house and hang out and talk about making pizza. It seems crazy. But we want to provide those varied experiences. All of our content is made by third-party developers. That developer could be you right now making a game about doing talks. Anything is possible on our platform. And what I love about it is that people can express themselves in a true metaverse environment and how they want to show themselves. So if you want to have a cat on your head or dress up like a penguin because you love Linux, just go ahead and do it super fun and really engaging from a, uh, and uh, because Roblox is completely powered by imagination and we don't want to provide limits around what people can do, but we always want to sure, make sure that we keep them safe. Now, all of this awesome stuff I talked about runs on what we call the Roblox cloud. And now cloud is this overused term where I, you know, you know, I hear about it. It's like there's a cloud coffee maker and a cloud this. Well, what is a Roblox cloud? The Roblox cloud is the collection of our infrastructure that we use to be able to service our players and our external developers. As I mentioned, all of our content is made by external developers uh, for the game, from the game's perspective. And so we build uh, that cloud and that infrastructure to service, those, service the external developers first. We do it to serve our internal customers or developers internally. And we want to be very agile in what we can do. And that's why we call it a cloud, because cloud is about agility. When I first started in the industry, 
you ordered a server, you had the server person, they racked and stacked it, blah, blah, blah. It took two, you know, two to 12 weeks to bring a server online. We want to enable so that way there are, our developers are sitting around bored because they can't develop fast enough because we have so much capacity for them and so many different services they can utilize. Now, we just want to go over a few Roblox infrastructure principles to kind of level set around what we're thinking here, and that'll play into the larger discussion. So first, we're building a globally available hybrid cloud to serve our players, which means we use bare metal as our primary focus for providing all of our services. We're 95% plus bare metal with a little bit of hint of cloud providers here and there for, for the icing on the cake. And the idea is we want to keep costs down because at the end of the day, what we're doing is while we're a game platform, while we have people playing on it, we're effectively taking those, that compute, using it for a purpose and reselling it, much like most companies do. So while we keep down costs, we can enable and pay developers more as they develop games. And then ultimately, again, lower the, uh, the challenges it is to deal with infrastructure. So whether we run services in cloud or in bare, or in bare metal, we make it transparent to both our external and internal developers and how they deal with that. At the end of the day, the goal is, regardless of what we, what we use, what technologies, tools, how we play systems, whatever, we want to enhance that player experience. We want to get them to get into the game. We want it to be really fast. We want them to be energized. We want them to have reliable access to the services. So no matter where they're at in the world, whether on a mobile phone, whether they're on Wi-Fi, whether they're on their PCs or their Macs, whatever it may be, they're able to get into those services and it works. Because at the end of the day, how do you explain to a nine-year-old that Roblox is broken? If they go to their app and they open it, they don't go to like down detector or like you know, do a trace route or anything like that. They hit the button, the game loads or it doesn't, the experience loads, the chat loads or it doesn't, and that's really it. And there isn't much to explain. And it's kind of funny because sometimes we get, we, get, we get tickets, right, from players. I can't play today. I'm sad. There is nothing actionable about that, but there's nothing actionable that a nine to 12 year old can really talk about. So it's really sad to us when we see those tickets, we just want it to work. And so that's the core goals that we have here for the Roblox infrastructure. Now we're globally distributed, as I mentioned. We have 20 to 22 pops. And again, depending on when we actually launch this talk, we'll probably be closer to the 22 side. We place our pops as close as we can to the players. But the idea is, is we provide a compute and network connectivity in each pop. The idea there being is that we want to have the best possible player experience. So if you're in Los Angeles, if you're in UK, we want you to play on game servers that are really close to you so that way you can use, utilize them and get a good experience. And also we have a really amazing feature where let's say you do have a friend in the UK and you're in the Southwest United States, we can do equidistant latency mapping so that way we can place you on a game instance where both of you can have an equal experience. So you might be playing out in New York even though you're in those different areas. And that's what makes it important for us to have that type of presence. We're going to continue to expand our pop and our pop footprint as it makes sense for different environments. And just, and trust me, as we talk about it today, we're definitely going through that experience right now by, by increasing our compute everywhere. And we're, again, where it makes sense, we burst into AWS and we have connectivity at most of these locations into either AWS or other providers uh, for what we're trying to do. So, uh, Adam actually started a few months more before me, so I want him to tell the story about our existing load balancer solutions when he joined and what that, what that experience was. So I'm going to hand off to Adam and continue to control the slides here, and then uh, we'll, we'll hear this story. So Adam, take us away. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, so when I started, we had um, just a little over one and a half core data centers. That was it. Uh, that infrastructure that Rob just displayed uh, hadn't been built out yet. And we were in the process of procuring all that hardware and shipping it everywhere. Um, and we had a very, very rudimentary deployment of a load balancing solution at Roblox. So what we had deployed at the time was, and for anonymity purposes, we'll call it the tornado solution. We deployed tornadoes in our core data center as, um, as a load balancing solution for all of our web traffic uh, coming in from the players. Uh, at the time, of course, uh, the Red Tornado was a, was a market leader when it came to load balancing technology, specifically in the, in the physical chassis that were being deployed and sent uh, to, to basically everybody at the time. Um, they were easy to manage by hand. And when I say they were managed by hand, some of the features were relatively automated. When a new component would come online, and you might think of a component, you'll probably hear me and Rob use that terminology a lot. It's almost like a microservice uh, at, at Roblox, but less containerized and more just a bare metal uh, uh, instantiation of a, of a service. So um, a component would come online, it might have 
three, eight boxes. Uh, it would have to be load balanced behind a VIP. Those boxes, the VIP itself, there was no automation around doing uh, any of that work. That was all done by hand. But there weren't a whole lot of those to do, so, the, so it was okay to do those by hand. Then the, bo the boxes, the, the servers on the back ends uh, would be populated using some rudimentary automation. Uh, and it was okay that that existed uh, in that fashion. Uh, but at the time, because we only had the one core data center, there was really no need for traffic engineering. There were no uh, distributed uh, load balancing solutions. It was all just in that core data center. So as time went on, uh, we started having more and more of these clusters of red tornadoes. And uh, me personally, I'm not a huge fan of cluster technology. Uh, what it ends up coming down to is, is that you, you kind of pigeonhole yourself into being a clustered uh, technology expert. And Rob can tell you some of the, the pains that he's had with working with other vendors and cluster technologies. Uh, but frankly, here uh, in this particular use case, I, don't, I didn't feel like it, it, it made a lot of sense for us to continue to scale in this model. Because when, when a cluster would get overwhelmed, we'd have to go and deploy um, you know, another cluster of the same thing. And those hand-jacked configs that existed on the boxes, they didn't scale. Um, and they made it really difficult uh, when, you know, when it came time to add more capacity because someone, a, a human, would have to get involved in the provisioning process uh, and, and all that clustering technology would have to be done by hand. And if you weren't an expert in that field, um, you know, we, we, you would just get lost. Yeah, and to, to cut further that comment, I've done a lot of work in like around firewalls and, and scaling sessions, and, uh, session state and session sync. And eventually what you get to is that you have these real time objects that just, it just stay random state, doesn't matter what it is. And you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of them, and maybe even a billion or more sessions to be able to scale. And in my work around like various internet service providers, mobile carriers and stuff, I can just say over time, scaling that nearly becomes impossible. We had a solution I worked at for one organization to scale over a billion real time objects per second. Let's just say it never happened because it becomes really difficult to do. Um, so one of the first things I wanted to tackle um, at Roblox was to create a more automated framework by which uh, load balancing could be deployed. And so what we ended up doing was, uh, in networking terms, we, we used a protocol called BGP. And some of you might be familiar with it, but if you're not, think of it as uh, service discovery for IP addresses. And so we would deploy a uh, various different uh, VIPs using different IP addresses. They would be injected using this protocol called BGP into the routing fabric. Uh, and then DNS would just load balance those VIPs uh, and provide some amount of uh, uh, observability and scalability outside of our infrastructure uh, to access these, these individual uh, red tornado boxes. Um, I wrote some automation tools. Um, Red Tornado did have some, and as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, an evangelist of Ansible. So they had some Ansible modules that existed. I wrote some, some uh, automation around how VIPs could be provisioned on hosts, how to add and remove nodes to those pools. Uh, and, uh, but it kept a lot of those old principles that we had uh, previously where basically one IP meant one service or one IP meant one component, which unfortunately doesn't scale. Uh, you know, if, if you only have a slash 24 of IP addresses, then you can only deploy, you know, 254 um, IP addresses or, or services for that. Um, and then, so I decided I was going to go down the route of trying to work with the vendor itself to try to get some automation tools that might fit better into our workflow. Um, but what it came down to was is that our hardware vendor really wanted to push their holistic solution for telemetry, automation, and scalability, including licensing, uh, which didn't necessarily fit into our idea that we wanted to own and operate these technologies ourselves. Um, it ended up becoming a very complicated uh, web of understanding how um, they wanted tech or they wanted the automation framework to work and us getting it to, to actually do what we wanted it. Uh, they, th at the end of the day, it would have been us, if we had adopted the, the Red Tornado automation framework, we would have had to given up all of our um, choices in this matter and given basically the full submission to their technology uh, to scale the way that we wanted to. And that just was not a compromise that we wanted to make at the time. And, uh, and so we, we, we opted to, to invest time and effort into making uh, something else that, that fit better into our workflow, that could follow uh, you know, our, our ideology that we wanted to be open source, 
Um, and, you know, we're going to talk a lot about uh, how that was a really good choice and helped us. And in my experience, I've worked with multitudes of vendors upon multitudes of vendors in my career for automating this stuff. And if you're not familiar, like in the network space versus like server automation, um, you know, there's a lot of open standards or open ideas, but what it kind of comes down to is this political battle for who opens and who controls those standards and those capabilities. And in the end of the day, while there are hooks and capabilities, APIs, NetConf, RESTConf, all these different ideas out there, it still is a very muddled solution uh, and there's no, nothing holistically uh, designed. So if you look even at something like Cisco, who made routers 30, 35 years ago, they still to this day don't have like the quintessential manage it all solutions. There've been many solutions, many iterations of it, but just network management in general has never really been something that's solved. And so a lot of companies like ourselves end up writing our own tools and then maybe is this continuous battle uh, between elements. So when it came down to it, we, we decided to just do the pros and cons list. You know, we, we had invested a lot of time and effort into the, um, Red Tornado, we had operational experience with it. Our people understood how it worked. Our developers, you know, knew the phrases and technologies when we were talking with them. They knew what they, you know, they would just throw the things at us so that they knew. But some of the cons of, of continuing to scale with the Red Tornado um, is, is that at some point, the cost of the deployment can actually exceed the value that it's actually providing. And though uh, this, this particular vendor have very, very specialized chips, specifically for things like um, uh, hardware acceleration for TLS sessions, et cetera, um, at the end of the day, it, it didn't make a whole lot of sense for us to continue to scale um, using that technology. Uh, the APIs, again, it was, there was, it was a constant battle to try to understand. And, with, and actually with each iteration where they changed uh, for major revisions, uh, the automation could completely change and we would have to rewrite all of our tools. Uh, and we would always be at the, at the mercy of the vendor for how those upgrades would happen. Um, when you're dealing with one particular box and you need to migrate from one major version to the next, it's a very painstaking process of draining the host uh, and, and, and you know, upgrading the code. And then if the code didn't work, the rollback is also extremely difficult. Uh, and then frankly, one of the biggest drawbacks to it is, is that because it's a physical chassis, sometimes when capacity crunches would happen at Roblox, um, in the past, it could take up to six weeks for them to make new physical chassis and ship them to our data center. And as Rob mentioned, um, you know, when you're dealing with, with rack and stack in, in, in data centers, it's very, very difficult to coordinate those um, uh, complicated uh, tasks, especially when these these applicate or these appliances are so different and unique from any of the other boxes in a data center. Absolutely. So we're not saying that these are bad products; they don't work very well or any of that. We're saying they actually do all of that. But at some point, you just kind of make that decision: Hey, am I going to build this or I'm going to buy it? In our case. We made that decision that we, we felt that the products were the cost was exceeding the value and it was time for something else. So before we just go ahead and build something, which is always fun, by the way, we kind of want to size up what the requirements of what we're looking to do. We want to build a solution that's going to last us, let's say, three to five years. Three to five years where we can scale with the specific design and we don't have to go ahead and revisit all up all those different components of those particular issues. So when looking at this, it, not, it doesn't come down to just saying, hey, I want you know, a few more boxes with a bigger CPU or a different Xeon processor or whatever it may be. It comes down to a lot of different elements that you have to take into account for this. So when we're looking at plugging these into the network, we can't just say plug these into any part of the network. We have to think about the overall uh, capacity, what the network can provide. Now, effectively, right, just very some simple math here. Uh, you have a rate of packets, and the packets have a specific size, or they're generally going to be a mixed size uh, for the different packet sizes. And then you multiply that together, and you're going to get the throughput, or the total throughput of what that, uh, the, the network traffic would be. Now, this is all great when you're having that conversation from a network engineering perspective, but packets and flows per second, like in, in those capacities, it gets confusing, right? So we boil this down also to like total requests per second, or like an HTTP request, and then take that, break it to throughput, break, break it down to packets, and do a little bit of packet math, here's what we call it. And so we wanted to ensure something that we could do like up to 10 gigabits per second per box, you know, just assuming that being our default NIC. 
something that we were, we're going to assume, like, let's say a middle size packet, like 500 bytes to let's say 700 bytes for responses. And then we want to make sure we can handle, uh, you know, not necessarily the line rate of 10 gig, like 14.8 million packets per second, but let's say around like four to 5 million packets per second would be reasonable depending on the packet size, what we would do. We also want to not only think about network capacity and throughput, but different elements that we can integrate, right? So we're huge on using console for doing service discovery for various services and backends. We want something that we have options to integrate with that service. Console, if you don't know, is a service discovery system made by HashiCorp. It does key value pair management, a lot of other things, but you can basically just register services into it on random ports and whatever it may be, and then query it either via DNS or an HTTP API to find all of your backends automatically. Um, very simple uh, to use, but you know, very, very scalable for the solution for us. We also require OCSP stapling, which is basically a way for us to look up that the cert is valid, staple the response from the cert provider, and then hand that back to our client. And the idea is, is this reduces round trip times for them to have to look that up themselves. So if they're on a mobile connection, like on their phone, it gets slow, it gets, you know, just another round trip that's a waste of time. And then with these solutions, we want to scale both horizontally and vertically. We want to add n number of nodes in parallel, you know, whatever type of box we may have, or even beef, get a beefier box with more CPUs, more memory, whatever it may be, to be able to scale it up. And in case maybe even uh, increasing the NIC speed past uh, 10 gigabits per second, as you know, 10 gig, while it's been around, it's kind of old at this point, you have new technologies you may want to take advantage of. We also don't want to have to buy a bunch of special servers. We want to use the things that we have today. We have existing hardware SKUs that we use for different classes of devices, web devices, web tier, uh, database tier, and things like that. And so we want to ensure that we can use those because if we have to go ahead and start building our, our own types of servers to do this, it kind of defeats the point and it makes it more of an appliance than just using a server. And as Adam highlighted, as we're building and scaling this, we want operating it to be very simplistic. Because at the end of the day, we might have hundreds and hundreds of nodes we need to automate and configure, and we don't want to have to sit and do it manually and copy and paste it. Trust me, I was there in the beginning in our, one of our offices when I first started watching Adam do this. While again, it was feasible then, it is certainly not feasible now. And so we have to have all those capabilities to, change, to do what we want with automation. And without it, we would be stuck very soon. And we're looking again at a three to five year design we want to build on. So simple, keep it simple, make it easy, and make it extensible. So let's talk about building that scalable load balancing solution. We're gonna go through some of the technologies, capabilities, and, and whatnot that builds the solution. While this is generally very network centric, we're not gonna go and deep dive around every packet, every protocol, every byte, and every bit. We're gonna talk about this in a generic fashion from the solution perspective, but give you enough information that you need to understand uh, where we're going with the design. Now, what we needed to think about first was if we wanted to be able to scale this uh, across multiple backend proxy devices, we need to be able to do it and have effectively like load balancing for load balancing, right? Because we want to be able to, again, have n number of backends and then send that traffic to them in a, in a stateless way. Now, when we talk about state versus stateless is that the decision factor here, that little orange question mark we see in the middle, it can't it doesn't necessarily need to know anything about the packet before it or the packet after it. So it's just randomly gonna be some packet and it needs to make the decision to send it to the correct backend without breaking the connection for the, for the user or the player. And then all layer four load balancers should also have the same uh, types of flows to the same node. So that way, if we have like uh, n number of these question marks in the middle, to kind of scale it up. It doesn't matter which device they go through, it should be able to make the same decision to same, send it to the same backend. So that way we kind of think of this as like an intelligent router, handling packets, not handling individual flows of traffic, but being able to con have continuity for that flow so it doesn't break TCP or the, the layer four protocols. So uh, uh, with TCP here, the idea is, we've heard about it, just a real quick refresher. TCP is a transport protocol. It comes in the packet just after the IP or IP header. It doesn't matter IPv4 or IPv6. Either one is, totally works with this. So it's a flow-based communication method. You start a connection, you continue to use it, send data down that same flow or the connection. Um, you usually have the same destination port and same destination IP, of course, the same from the source. Uh, but, and then that continues to have that flow. TCP handles a lot of things like congestion management. So if the connections back up, if packets are lost, things like that, it just ensures that the delivery of that protocol. So when we talk about L4, layer four, that means from the OSI networking stack uh, where that comes from. Uh, so L4, layer four, TCP, 
all of those are going to be interchangeable from this. So an example, again, with a type of packet is we have a destination IP, and specifically a port, in this case 443, the default port for, port for HTTPS. Um, we don't care what's in the data because, again, with HTTPS, it's all encrypted. Uh, and then in this case, the IP protocol number is uh, 6, which is TCP. So that's part of the IP header. Again, if you're not familiar with this, no big deal, just a quick refresher as we go through this discussion. Now, for the layer four load balancer, we chose a product called GitHub Load Balancer Director, or GLB for short. If you're interested in learning more about this, in the bottom right, you can see the link to this on GitHub, or just search uh, GLB-Director, guaranteed you'll find it. Let's talk about what this means and the properties that were so compelling to us and what it can do. We'll just do a quick packet walk through here. So first, the internet decides how the packet, the player gets to us. There's BGP, internet routing, all of these technologies. We engage with the internet, tell, tell, tell it where we're at, and then eventually the packets get over down to us. Um, from there, the routers receive the packets and do what's called equal cost multipath or ECMP hashing. And the idea here is just think about it simple. We take a packet in, we have multiple destinations we can go to, in this case, two different GLB instances. It sends one packet to one, it sends the next packet to the other, back and forth, back and forth to give you that load balancing effectively to the load balancers itself. When the packet goes to GLB, what GLB does is it does a specific hash to ensure it's going to send the same packet to the same host. And the idea here being is it doesn't matter if there's one or 100 GLB instances, all of them will hash the same connections in the same way to send it to the same host. So this is now a stateful connection. An example of a comparison would be in Linux, there's a technology called IPVS, which provides a similar type of capability. The downside is, is that you need to do state synchronization across multiple IPVS instances. And again, as we talked earlier, state synchronization, especially at scale, can be a problem. And it's a pain for us. So by using this and this amazing design, we're able to get that same type of stateful processing, processing of the traffic, but doing it statelessly. Now, all of the hosts in the back end use the same IP address. How is that possible? We just tunnel the packet using some uh, generic UDP encapsulation, and then that will send it to a specific endpoint. So each one of these nodes have a private IP, but effectively the packet from the player comes in and it's using the same public IP. So that, that, that therefore it doesn't matter which host it go to, all we care about is that GLB sends it to the same host to keep that TCP state fresh. Now, in the event that there's some issue, the proxy isn't running, the you know, connection gets lost or a packet gets confused, the technology here is we actually include additional next hop information. So let's say it gets to the proxy on the left, the proxy is not running, the connection isn't valid, whatever, there's a kernel module that will forward the packet to the next possible host that could use it and do it so on and so forth. And the value is, we call this the second chance design as part of the product, it will ensure that the packet can have an opportunity to get to the right host just in case for some reason a network uh, connectivity happened and, and, and that would have occurred there. If you're interested in the more details about that, please check out their uh, GitHub site and you can learn more about all the details and uh, about how that works. Now Adam's going to go over uh, L7 for us. Yeah, so as we mentioned earlier in the, in the slide deck, uh, the previous design that we had for load balancing was basically one IP equated to one microservice or one component if you're using Roblox speak. Um, and we wanted to get away from that scaling model. We wanted to take, as Rob mentioned, one IP and have it represent multiple services on the back end. We wanted to host and when I say one IP, I, I want to be flexible there to say that we could probably have different types of IPs for different ingresses. But the idea being that we're not scaling as as widely uh, when it comes to uh, the L the layer three or the IP of the of the particular services, um, and that's for a number of different reasons. The IPv4 address. Um, are, are in scarce supply um, and also this just this whole idea of being able to take uh, this this IP inject it via BGP which again is the service discovery for IP across a, an entire lit, uh, fabric made it really easy for us but the question now becomes now that everything is focused on one IP how do you differentiate traffic for www.roblox.com versus getting assets for the games that are that are also on Roblox. Uh, and that happens at layer seven. So layer seven, of course, is the application layer. Um, for HTTP, one of the differentiators when we're talking about routing uh, is, is very simply the, the host header. And in the host header, we can distinguish which particular backend we need to service the traffic from. Um, we also needed to add the layer seven, which, I mean, it's not as, as 
as important, but we do do, uh, we consider HTTPS part of uh, layer seven, as you have to do some negotiation about uh, which particular certificate you're trying to get, uh, et cetera. Uh, but also at layer seven, we needed to have some other technologies that existed to protect our applications. Specifically, we needed, we needed a, a layer seven um, reverse proxy that had the types of load balancing algorithms that our developers were used to, uh, specifically uh, least connection members, round robin. Uh, we also had this idea that we needed to be able to persist connections to backends. Um, in most cases, we were, we were relying on the local cache of the web servers themselves, but because we had to persist based on IP and because we weren't sharing session state across all of our load balancing members, uh, we had to be able to hash uh, sources and destinations consistently across all of our layer sevens. So I, at layer four, Rob talked about hashing flows. Layer seven, it had to do the same thing, but for uh, IP addresses of, of players or clients uh, to backends themselves. So we had to select something that could, that could support all of those features, uh, which a majority of um, reverse proxies uh, in the modern days can, can do that. Uh, but we landed on one particular product uh, specifically. And that was HA proxy. So some of you might know HA proxy, and you might say, well, you know, it's not a very modern uh, proxy, but in all actuality, HA proxy has been in development for a long time. And with every iteration, they're making their product better, uh, more resilient, and they're modernizing all the technology that goes into HA proxy, which is part of the reason why we ended up, um, if you hearken back to the slide that Rob had about our requirements, HA proxy fulfilled all of those requirements and more. Um, they have an open source community, which is pretty robust, and they're very uh, adamant about helping people onboard. Um, but more than anything, they had every configuration knob that we needed. In fact, they had more configuration not, uh, than Dead Mouse on his uh, DJ equipment. Um, and, and, as Adam, oh, and as Adam mentioned, uh, this is all open source. So uh, they actually have been doing this for a long time. So they have their own repo, git.haproxy.org. Uh, check it out if you're interested. And there's also like a GitHub mirror as well if you're, if you're more of a GitHub fan for that. Um, and as you can see, they've been around for a really long time. And what a lot of people don't, re they don't realize is, is that the HA proxy that existed in 2006, 2007 is not the same one that exists today. Uh, when I first brought it up in, uh, within our group, the first thing was, was well, I thought they uh, stuck everything to a single thread. Well, you know, they've modernized, they've made some improvements, and as I mentioned, they're trying to make it as the premier open source uh, reverse proxy that exists. And they do support things like service discovery mechanisms using console. They've partnered with, with uh, other large companies that uh, use console to make some really great integrations, uh, which made it really nice for us to be able to smoothly transition uh, from the Red Tornado and into HA proxy as a layer seven uh, reverse proxy. Uh, I like to say HA Proxy has almost been doing this as long as I have, and I've used it throughout my entire career for different means, for different purposes, and I kind of consider it a friend of mine that's, that's been there uh, anytime I've needed load balancing solutions. So I'm going to start talking about first our edge termination solution. So the idea here is you saw that map with all of the little Roblox logos of all of our locations. And the idea is, is that if you're a player and you want to get content, before this project, you'd have to go all the way from where you're at all the way to one of our core data centers to be able to fetch information. And while we're not necessarily deploying web servers in every one of those pop locations, the idea is, is we want to reduce the TCP latency for players. So when you go ahead and create a new connection in your browser or whether it's through the game platform itself, you're going ahead and fetching data, you're pulling this data back. By doing an edge termination, but for the players, we actually were able to save initially 200 to 500 milliseconds per request for the player. We weren't able at that point to do the full DC load balancing with the same stack, so we used the Tornado solution. However, in this design, immediately we were able to get value out of it. This was able to prove our point and prove the point of the design without having to impact all the players globally. Since you would just use one of the local locations, we were able to start dog fooding it ourselves from our offices down into San Jose and then going from there. And it was just amazing to see that, you know, you have a service, you click on it a million times to validate and check it, and all of a sudden you noticeably can see that difference in page load time. Incredible. Um, also, too, by having edge termination, you know, unfortunately, there's this thing called DOSs or DDoSs uh, for denying, denying service for players, and that makes them sad, and we don't want that. 
So if we're able to take a, an edge term uh, location and we're able to get DDoS, we're able for that location either to absorb the DDoS or be able to uh, deflect it or, de or, or deal with the DDoS so that way all, all possible locations were uh, impacted. In the event that the service is impacted, we automatically route around that pop and go to the next pop that's most convenient for the player, which is awesome. And it's awesome for folks like us that we work super hard and we don't have to spend, spend, uh, stay up all night reconnecting or reconfiguring things, let the network reconfigure itself. Um, and from a scaling perspective, what are the elements we can do here? So we can add additional internet peering or internet capability to add more bulk transport capability for IP. We can scale the GLB nodes uh, by uh, horizontally and vertically. We can add a number of them, as many as we need. We can do the exact same thing for HA proxy. So it's very simple for us to add and, and increase capacity. All we have to do is make a request. The server team allocates the devices and boom, we're scaled and ready to go. No truck rolls, nobody needs to go on site, just reprovision some servers that are used for other stuff and here we go. So I'm gonna hand this over to Adam to talk about the DC load balancing aspect of this. Yeah, so as Rob mentioned, the first time we deployed a pop, uh, the pop was GLB with HA proxy pointed at the Red Tornado solution. Uh, what we noticed and what we had to work through were some issues with the compatibility between those two solutions. Uh, having HA proxy service requests for um, Red Tornado, it worked, but it wasn't great. And some of our developers were noticing that there were, there were issues uh, with that being the, the, the solution. And so luckily I had gone through all the pain of automating Red Tornado inside the data center, that porting over and creating a data center solution that mirrored our edge solution was relatively easy. And all I needed was uh, a few spare boxes. Um, so we set it up, I actually instantiated uh, mass uh, just to, to image the boxes themselves. Um, and uh, I was able to build a solution in a matter of a few days uh, that completely replaced the, the edge termination back to our um, core data centers. Um, it allowed for the seamless transition of uh, requests coming across our edge uh, to hit our data center and provide the same level of uh, redundancy and resiliency that we had already uh, achieved uh, at the POP, but also at the data center. Um, we do have some scaling issues within our data center uh, because, you know, one of those uh, red tornado boxes uh, could handle hundreds of thousands of requests because that was really what the intent of the box was for, uh, that we had to deploy many more different backend, or I'm sorry, uh, reverse proxies to, to, to replace that, uh, that instance. Um, however, uh, of course, the cost of a, of a, a pizza box server versus uh, Red Tornado appliance was was drastically different. We were able to deploy, you know, hundreds of, of instances uh, without even breaking a sweat. Um, and again, there's some scaling problems that we're having inside the data center because of, you know, we swapped out one chassis for 10. Um, but, you know, overall, I think it was, the, it was the right choice for us to make to alleviate some of that stress of the edge termination going through uh, a different path for the for the players uh, to streamline those connections uh, made it uh, easy for us to triage and troubleshoot and, and it just made sense. Excellent yes and and uh, that's a great example of how we built that solution out. I love it. So what's also benefit to us as well is that we for this solution we ended up choosing Prometheus for being able to do scraping. It's something that's built right into HA proxy uh, and we used a stats e exporter for doing information from GLB. We used Grafana for visibility as, you know, Grafana, to my opinion, is like one of the best built web applications of all time. Uh, and also built, not using this information, self-service charts for our, our internal users. So instead of hitting up Adam or myself and, hey, what's load balancing doing? They can just look on their, click on a link, find their component and find all that information. These metrics are extremely deep. And if you go to buy the, uh, the amazing book around Prometheus from O'Reilly, there's a chapter on the HA proxy exporter. Um, and so it's now built in, but it was a separate piece of software at the time. And it says at the top, warning, you are gonna see issues with storing this data and dealing with it because it will be so large. And that is a very true statement. The data has huge cardinality. So that means there's a lot of variance between various labels in the, uh, in the information uh, for based on backends or, or proxies or, or backend solutions that we connect to or components. This explodes and blows up time series data and causes us to have hundreds and hundreds of gigs per day of, of uh, metrics information. 
Now, while all of this is terrifying and has been somewhat of an effort to keep up with the growth of the platform, it is 100% worth it. We are able to zero in on the minutia of the minutia to explain what's happening. And honestly, at the end of the day, when you're building such a giant solution, you need to know what's happening to have that observability. And it has been amazing for us to figure stuff out. And Adam, did you want to add some more words since you, you were the long-term expert here in, in the, what we've had before with the visibility? Yeah, as Rob mentioned, we had some different monitoring solutions for the um, uh, for the red tornadoes. We were using SNMP polling on a product called Observium for a while. We used, um, and that's an open source product as well. And we used um, Telegraph and um, InfluxDB to store a lot of the time series database when we made an upgrade. However, I personally love Prometheus because of how easy and flexible it is for me to make queries. Um, the, the interface is relatively easy to, to navigate. I don't necessarily need to be a database expert to understand how all of the operators work on the data that exists there. Uh, there's really valuable feedback, especially from Grafana and then the Prometheus interface itself, where I can just dive straight into the data and make some of the collections uh, or you know, display the information that I need for, for, for my application. Um, I come from a networking centric background and one of the things I say frequently is, is that it's impossible to prove a negative. And what ends up happening a lot is that developers have a lot of questions about the block, black box that is load balancing or networking. And sometimes there's just not enough information from the networking point of view to prove that it's not necessarily the network. There's never a log file that says it's not my fault. Uh, but what's really nice about Prometheus is, and especially from the, from the, the immensity of data coming off of HA proxy uh, in Prometheus format, is, is that I have a, a wealth of data. Uh, I've created a per component or per microservice uh, dashboard where people can literally see the health of their particular service, the, the latency that's coming off of HA proxy, uh, any queuing time, that's always a frequent thing is like, is HA proxy making my request slow? Uh, and there's a beautiful dashboard where people can just look and see that it's not, but that actually the queuing is happening on the, on the back end. And uh, again, it's not trying to prove who's right or wrong in this instance. It's to provide enough data so that developers can action on the, the thing that's making their application slower. And it, and it provides us a, a, a way to communicate that more efficiently. Absolutely. So we've talked about the design. Let's talk about using it. So we went and initially started this uh, total project for the design, maybe took uh, five, six months, uh, getting automation, doing building, testing and scaling. We started rolling out edge termination, but I would say like the migration is when we had the full both edge and core terminate our core setup uh, enabled. So uh, we had been working on this for some time, as I mentioned, but we had to accelerate that as one often needs to. We ended up having a, a security issue uh, from the existing products. And unfortunately, for the version we were running, it was a little bit old because it was challenging to update. And so we got into a situation where we were a little bit stuck. We could have done a major upgrade, but it put us at risk. We've tried to do this in the past to these versions. We've seen boxes brick. We've seen issues with it. So the bet was it would take longer to do the upgrade than to actually move to the new HA proxy solution. So we immediately migrated the critical services that day over into HA proxy to mitigate the issue and alleviate it. We found out about the security issue through Hacker One, which we use to communicate with the community around various security problems and, and roadblocks. And then folks can inform us and earn back bug bounties through that platform. We had just launched it. And then that same day, we had got this information, which was really valuable to us. The total time is it took about three to four weeks to migrate all of the services uh, over. Adam uh, put his TPM hat on, he put his engineer hat on, did a lot of internal coordination uh, to do that. And while this was not a very fun process to have to do it so rapidly, we ended up being extremely lucky that it happened the way as it did. Because then this thing happened, this once in a lifetime global lockdown, this once in a lifetime uh, issue of this of COVID-19. And when that happened, the world and, and its children turned to Roblox for a place to communicate and, 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 uh, can, can, and get together. So what I love about our CEO, Dave, is he doesn't want to pull punches. He wants us to challenge ourselves to do better. And what we wanted to provide during this time was the platform that these kids have known to love and to be able to grow with, with the rest of the infrastructure. There's articles out there about our player growth, but we've we seemingly felt like we grew one year worth of players in that one week. And trust me, we were tired. 
But what we did is instead of backing off or trying to do restrictions for people to access our platform or some sort of rate limiting, we engaged. We released information for teachers to be able to use the Roblox platform to teach and, and engage their, uh, their students. We also continued again to see player, player growth because players are at home, they don't have to go to school, schools were still figuring out what to do. So they turned to Roblox to play and communicate with their friends. We continue to run our largest event, the Bloxy Awards, which is kind of like the Oscars, but for Roblox for making games. And we ran it just as on schedule with no changes. So that way we can continue to have our community. And we were even engaged by the One World Together concert, uh, originally run by Lady Gaga and other folks that was just broadcast on everything and also engaged that way kids or anybody could use Roblox to go into virtual concert halls, talk with their friends, buy virtual merch and engage, and then just watch the concert and hang out. It was really incredible to see that. If we didn't have that report from that security vulnerability, which then led to this accelerated rollout, the red tornado would have spun out of control and well, it just wouldn't have provided us. We wouldn't have been able to get boxes fast enough and we could have been in trouble because everybody was looking to scale at the exact same time for what was happening. Yeah, luckily we had um, spare boxes in, in almost all of our data centers where we could uh, take, uh, take player traffic and try to uh, terminate the traffic as close to them as possible, as well as scale our core data centers uh, to absorb all of this new, this new traffic, this new growth that we were seeing because the kids were just stuck at home. Uh, one of the things, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, is I'm extremely passionate about uh, low latency play for everybody. And one of the, the things that, that you know, brings, brings me a little bit of joy was is the day that we cut over um, Italy's traffic to one of the data centers that's closer to the Italian players. Um, I knew that they were going through a really difficult time being in lockdown as we're all going through or we're going through during this time. Um, and it was just nice for me that, that I knew that those players woke up the next day and they had no idea why, uh, but their games were loading faster. And I was able to uh, take traffic from a uh, myriad different countries and terminate them as close as they possibly could so that every, every player who was stuck at home uh, had a place where they could commonly go to uh, with their friends and with their family and communicate. Uh, you know, I'm here with my family at home. I have three kids that just enjoy the heck out of Roblox. Uh, they're, they're frequently, you know, FaceTiming their friends from school, uh, and they're able to meet in, in common places. It's really funny. One of their favorite games is Roblox High School. So even though they're not in high school, uh, they can still go to school and meet their friends. Uh, granted, they, you know, are fairies and have magical powers, but uh, it, it's fun for them. Uh, and it's a way for them to decompress. It was a continuity that, that we were able to provide uh, because of open source software. There's absolutely no way that we would have been able to scale with Red Tornado. Um, we, we would have ran out of capacity very fast. And that, that, that what seemed at the time a four month timetable of migrating all of the services would have been a, you need to migrate these services uh, in, in 42 hours or 48 hours and it would have been impossible. So the sacrifices that we made early in February paid off uh, in droves uh, in, in uh, March and April. Thanks Adam. I, we're wrapping up here, we have, we're running out of time. So I wanna cover a few more aspects uh, before we get there. So global traffic during this event has exceeded over two terabytes per second. So that's something when I had started, I remember we were like hundreds of gigabits per second. We're excited. Two terabits plus. That includes all game traffic, all HTTP, everything we're doing on our backbone. For this solution itself, we exceeded over 5 million requests per second. We're just simply like five, five weeks earlier or even less, we were just not even running any of these things. So amazing that we're able to build, scale, and absorb all of that. Every weekend, we would have peaks. Kids are out of school. They're playing. You know, summer times, we'd see big peaks every day became a new peak of growth. Every day it challenged every internal system and every Robloxian engineer to be able to make that continue to work. And what was great is that as Adam mentioned, we were able to provision those instances and move really fast to do it. We didn't have to rack and stack boxes and do weird things that are outside of the normal scope. And it made that possible for us to deliver. And I remember when Adam turned up that connections in Italy and other sites and just thinking like, we're just joking about all those kids waking up like, Mom, my Roblox is faster. And it's like, oh, what are you talking about? Well, trust me, parents, it was actually faster. We, uh, we could prove it with some metrics. So are we happy with this? Are we done? Of course not. We could always sharpen the razor and make it better. What are the things that we're looking at to kind of expand our horizons here and where we're going to grow for the next steps? We're going to look at load balancing as a service, allowing people to configure and design how their application interacts with us and doing it through various uh, tools and technology. We have an interface layer internally, an API system, 
RCS, Roblox Compliance, uh, Cloud Service API or interface. That, they, we, that way everyone can say, hey, how they want it configured and we don't have to worry about it. We're engaging and using the, uh, the HAProxy data plane API, which allows us to interact with HAProxy directly via a REST API, rather than just managing a config file. The REST API or data plane API does it for us. Um, we're f continuing to fuel HAP and just make sure that it's empowered. And I say we joke like through the souls of the fallen, right? Just through all the different folks that have you know struggled through all the challenges for managing Red Tornado for years, we're just fueling all of the, the, the capabilities of what we're doing with HAProxy with all the people that have suffered before the company for doing it. And most importantly, we're also deriving understanding internally during this rapid change. You have uh, solutions that we're using the legacy load balancing for, where people have been using it for years, and all of a sudden their world's changed. So the, through this talk and other more detailed talks internally, we're educating everybody to get them up to speed about what are the capabilities in R. Because at the end of the day, what really matters? The story of how we all came together internally to solve this problem for our players. So our players can get in, they can dress up like this really nice hot dog, iPod friend, and just enjoy time. Because at the end of the day, if kids can't play, if they can't enjoy the platform, if they can't get in there and love it, what the heck are we really doing here? So it doesn't matter, HA proxy or whatever some technology solutions, at the end of the day, we want kids to be happy. And of course, for all of the, the, the parents out there who are listening, for them to be happy as well so they can take a break without having to worry about managing and watching their kids nonstop through the, during this disaster. So if these things are interesting to you, if you find that these challenges are hard or not, maybe not, maybe not hard enough, let us know. You can reach out to Adam or I on LinkedIn directly, Rob Cameron, Adam Mills, we're both here at Roblox, or you can reach out to our normal page and just let us know. We know a lot of people have been impacted by this. We're not here necessarily to try to poach and get all the smartest minds in the world, but we're just saying, hey, if these things are interesting to you, if there's other talks out there that we've done that are interesting to you, let us know. And we can try to find something because we're always looking for the best and brightest to meet everything. So I want to say thank you to Adam Mills, to Canonical as well for hosting this event. And for all of you for watching, I'm Rob Cameron from Roblox. I just want to say thanks for so much, so much for watching and knowing that open source solutions and open source designs really need to come together to solve infrastructure. Because we're all in this together trying to solve the same thing. So we can either work together in that bizarre environment, or we can work in a cathedral, all quiet and isolated. But I love that bizarre, because let's work together to solve these problems and solve them together. Thanks, everybody, and I appreciate you for joining. Hello, all you crazy cats and kittens out there. I appreciate everyone for sitting around and watching our talk this morning here, uh, a little bit uh, early here in uh, SoCal, Los Angeles. But I uh, just wanted to say thanks for everyone joining here. Uh, there's some great questions uh, that uh, the audience has participated and provided. So I just want to get started on those. And then Adam and I will uh, take a chance to, to take a look at them here. And, and if uh, you don't remember from the talk, I'm, at, I'm Rob Cameron. And over here is my colleague, uh, Adam Mills, or oh, he's over on this side. So uh, first of all, a uh, question was, uh, which version of Ubuntu server are we using? Great question. So we originally started uh, with 1604 LTS and then had up uh, when we initially worked on some of the solutions. Uh, and then <clears throat> we that was kind of coming to the point where uh, 1804 was coming to a newer release or was coming out. So right before we had migrated to the enab enable the solution, we went ahead and uh, put over to 1804. We're currently running 1804.4 uh, with the 415 kernel is what we have targeted for that. Um, with the with that, the other questions were, do we ever plan on supporting Roblox uh, for Linux at platforms? Great question. So it is something that you know we take a look at and consider internally. I wouldn't say it's something that we have as a target uh, from an audience perspective. Uh, the idea there is that we support you know uh, Android, uh, iOS, uh, Mac, uh, Windows, and just the supportability around Linux. Totally technically possible to do, but just the cost, the QA, and whatnot, and the the player base is the concern there. However, uh, Canonical makes an awesome tool called Anbox. Uh, and there are some ports of that for x86 as well as for ARM emulation. Uh, that's something I would definitely take a look at if you're interested in running it on Linux. I can't say it's an officially supported solution, but Anbox itself is actually a really awesome technology. And we're looking at using it for some other things internally here at Roblox that I cannot say yet. Uh, however, that, uh, however, I would say uh, take a look at that. And also, if you want similar solutions um, for like Mac or Windows, there's a, com a, a product called BlueStacks, which allows you to run an Android applications in either environment to do mobile gaming. Pretty, pretty interesting uh, stuff all around, so I would suggest that. Uh, other questions here. Oh, now the questions are exploding all, all over here, so let's go back to this. Um, so a question about BGP route updates. 
Uh, good question about that. So in our BGP uh, integration with uh, GitHub Load Balancer, we went ahead and uh, wrote some integration with GoBGP, as we mentioned. We're seeing right now like about a one second uh, update delay. Uh, unfortunately, that solution doesn't support the protocol BFD or bi-directional forwarding detection, which is used for like, um, if you're not familiar with routing, it's just a simple like UDP ping between the two routing peers. And then if you have a uh, like drop three packets, basically or like in that health check, then the connection will go down and then BFD will automatically uh, reroute where some protocols like BGP or OSPF, it takes a long time for them to go ahead and converge. And so uh, BFD would be the better ideal scenario to get lower than the one second uh, failover times. But uh, otherwise, uh, you know, for, for now, we're, we're pretty satisfied with the solution. Uh, here, let's see, what other good questions do we have? Uh, a good question here uh, is that, uh, have you considered using Envoy versus HA proxy? It's a great question because Envoy is kind of the hot potato uh, load balancer now. It's used in a lot of service mesh solutions, console connect, uh, Istio, things like that. Uh, and it's really highly configurable. So we did an, uh, initially do a bake off with also Envoy uh, for doing testing. Performance looked really solid. It was lacking some features that HA proxy didn't have. Uh, one of those particular features was OCSP stapling. Uh, and what this is, is like when you go to a website, you get a certificate. When you get that certificate, it has information on it that says, hey, check out that if I'm actually valid, and this could be used with uh, OCSP, which is just a simple message, uh, and or it could also be um, a uh, another thing called a CRL, which is like a huge file you would download and parse. So the idea is, is that <clears throat> we do the lookup of that OCSP message, we staple that onto the, the certificate, so that way when the client looks at it, they're able to validate that the cert, cert is valid without having to do that secondary call. So that was something, unfortunately, Envoy didn't support. Uh, uh, Nginx was the only other thing that supported it directly. Um, but again, that was one of the big criteria why Envoy wouldn't have particularly worked for us. Uh, let's see, what other good questions do we have here? Oh, so the there was a question about um, expanding with uh, to other countries and like uh, where we where we wouldn't want to do or where we're going to do that or what we're looking to do. So great question. So Roblox is a globally available platform. So whether you're uh, in uh, you know Southeast Asia, you're in the Middle East or whatnot, depending on availability from your country, because some countries may may or may not block Roblox, but everybody can play everywhere. And what's also nice about it is that you can play with anybody anywhere in the world. So I can play with my nieces and nephews in Europe, and it's a similar experience as they were in here in the US due to the uh, latency matchmaking that we provide. Um, so with that, from a edge load balancing perspective, we continue to turn up additional countries to do the termination to, to speed up uh, their performance. This is something that happens all the time, and it's not something we particularly notify uh, anybody of doing it. You will see a performance enhancement when it comes in from about 200 to 500 milliseconds delay, <clears throat> excuse me, reduction on all of the web calls. Um, but at the end of the day, I would say we're going to fully edge terminate the world to various locations and pops. It was just a matter of time for getting capacity up there or being able to do various tricks to do that. Um, how do you decide where players go to watch sites for edge termination? All right, great question. So we use some DNS tricks um, using some DNS providers. And the idea here is, is when you go ahead and look up um, you know, roblox.com, depending on your source location, depending on the country you come from and other factors, which can't fully discuss from a security perspective, uh, we make an intelligent routing decision for where, where you're going to go. Um, and in that case, if we find that it's unoptimal uh, through various telemetry and metrics, will enhance those decisions over time to put you close to the closest environment. So even if you were in a situation where like I'm in SoCal, uh, going to Lo the Los Angeles uh, pops or locations obviously makes a lot of sense. But if I was in, let's say Las Vegas, not too far away, but, but still a, a good distance from LA, where would that best location be? So we might terminate you to like Los Angeles, it might be to San Jose, it might be something in Texas and those different locations, um, but we're always looking for optimizing that. So sometimes it comes down to how do you maximize performance by minimizing latency? And at the end of the day, there's no like clear quick win for it. It just takes a lot of analytics and a lot of data to pour over. And that's what I really love about like traffic engineering in general is that 
it's not just, hey, we're terminating some traffic and, you know, connections and packets and stuff like that. There's a lot of like data science behind it and being able to drill down to all the metrics and uh, the minutia of the minutia. <clears throat> and that like those details, for example, is like, what's the TCP startup time? Like, what's the latency from that network, that provider? Like, is it a cellular provider? Is it a wireless provider? Uh, what types of things could it be? Um, lots of things go into play with it. I would say it's something we're always enhancing. And a lot of uh, the things we're enabling now are like active diagnostics where versus like just looking at like location and country uh, positioning, we could say, oh, based upon these active health checks, we can transition you to other sites and whatnot for optimizations. Um, a Roblox get question here, which I think is awesome. Uh, what types of different games could you potentially make with Roblox? So what's interesting about the Roblox platform that maybe I didn't highlight well enough is that you can kind of do just about anything. So an example is, is that Roblox games, and in a lot of games uh, from a developer's perspective are written in the Lua programming language. So there's actually a game in Roblox to learn how to program in Lua. So what I think is hilarious about that is it's a game that, uh, you know, uh, it's a game that isn't really a game per se, like you would play with a winning and characters and stuff like that, but you're just going ahead and learning and playing Roblox. Um, what I think is interesting about the Roblox platform, why we have like a say a top hundred games that get a lot of players, there are so many like small minutiae, small, small games that maybe have like 20, 30 players, right? Or maybe a hundred players that play in a week. But there's those communities that are built up around those games that talk on various forums or various chat rooms and stuff to connect. And I love stuff like that. And again, whether it's like working at a pizza place, programming, uh, you know, in Lua, or there's even some uh, Roblox games that aren't games. There was one uh, one developer that had made uh, Simpson scenes or other different scenes from TV shows and movies and re redid them in Roblox. So you didn't play the game per se, you just perceived and watched uh, watched it happen, which is pretty fascinating. And, and working inside of Roblox, it's great to see a lot of like incubators we bring in to build games, the creative and uh, ideas and solutions that they have. And uh, back when, uh, you know, life was a little bit more normal and we could go into the office and work with the incubators. It's just crazy to see walking down the hallway and seeing all the work uh, that they're doing in their offices or in their, their workspaces and the crazy ideas and whatnot that they, they build. So in the end of the day, you don't have to build a traditional game. You don't have to build really anything. It's, it's more of think about it as a metaverse, like uh, movies. There's a movie poster up there, like Ready Player One or the book Snow Crash. It really can be anything you potentially want it to be. Uh, Couple more questions here, uh, and then we'll be able to wrap up. And then we have some, uh, I believe, additional speakers coming on here. Um, so, from a server perspective, like what operating systems do we run? Uh, great question. So, majority of our servers now have crossed over into being Unix or Linux based uh, systems. Um, all, uh, I would say, majority are canonical is Ubuntu. Uh, we had done some CentOS for some various reasons. Uh, CentOS is a great OS. Um, uh, I like to joke, it's calling it the red menace. I've been working with the thing for so long. Um, but I think mostly uh, right now we're focused on migrating uh, all CentOS over to Ubuntu as well. Um, and then as well as um, on the platform side, we do have a lot of Windows. If you're not familiar with, like, with Windows, like in server environments, like at large scale, it's really actually common to see games companies were using Windows, especially uh, on backend servers, because a lot of game development traditionally comes on Windows. So it's very common to see Windows as well uh, on the back end and, uh, and everything uh, with that. But uh, the end goal is, is we're going to actually, hopefully by 2021 end of that, to move 100% over to Canonical's uh, Ubuntu Linux, so, which is really exciting for me, since I'm a huge Linux nerd. Um, so appreciate everybody for joining. Uh, we're running out of time here. I appreciate for everybody conversations uh, and hopefully uh, we can all see you again. Uh, there's also some other Ubuntu Masters uh, Roblox talks if you're interested that might provide some additional details. So lastly, I just wanted to say thank you for everything. I'm Rob Cameron and here's my peer, uh, Adam Mills. So whatever side you're on here, uh, we're both yeah, appreciate thanks everybody. everybody. Thanks Adam. All right, thanks everybody. Talk to you later.